Welcome everybody. This is the July 18th, 2023 occurrence of the P4.org Open Source Developer Days meeting. Today, as promised in email, announced widely, we have a special guest, Ryan Goodfellow from Oxide Computing Computer. I've forgotten the uh, you can introduce your your company name. Uh, and is and also you could you could maybe answer for me the question of does the name Oxide have anything, any correspondence to the programming language name Rust? Yes, and, uh, absolutely. The name absolutely is a nod to Rust. And, you know, we're a bunch of system programmers mostly uh, at Oxide and hardware engineers and things like that. But uh, we believe that Oxide uh, or that Rust has really enabled like a sea shift in systems programming. And so, yes, the, the name Oxide is definitely uh, a nod to the Rust programming language. You know? All right, with that, please take it away. All righty, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time listening to my talk today. I'm Ryan Goodfellow. Uh, I'm an engineer with the uh, Oxide Computer Company. Uh, I work uh, in the networking team uh, at Oxide and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we have built our product, uh, which is a rack scale computer uh, with P4 at the core of that product. Uh, and it's going to be in many places in our product right now. It's in our switches, uh, but we're hoping that it's going to be in our NICs and our software stacks and in many, many different places uh, in the, the stack that we have. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to get into it. Um, so a uh, quick outline of uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to give a little bit of context on uh, what is a rack scale computer uh, and where does P4 fit into that, just to kind of ground the, uh, the whole presentation. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit into why network programmability is critically important for us and has allowed us to deliver the product that we are delivering today. Uh, and as of last week, we actually are delivering. So we've been a startup for three, three and some odd years now, uh, and we have started delivering racks to customers. Uh, so, so very exciting time for us. So this is not uh, just uh, a notional thing that may exist from a young scrappy startup. We're, we're actually delivering things now, which is super exciting. Uh, I'm going to give then a little bit of an intro to the X4C compiler uh, that we've created, which is a Greenfield P4 compiler uh, built entirely in Rust and today generates Rust code uh, and a little bit of experimental RISC-V code that we're toying with with some uh, ASIC designs that we're playing with internally. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the workflows that that uh, that creates because the genesis of creating this compiler at Oxide was actually to get uh, testing, development, and CI workflows in place uh, before we actually had the full hardware available for us to do testing on. And even now that we do have the full hardware, it's not economically viable to have everyone on our network team have a pair of Tofinos uh, in their house. And power delivery in residential homes would be a little bit tricky for a rack scale computer. Uh, and I think people would be very displeased with their power bills. Uh, and so this is really a necessary tool for us to, to function effectively. Uh, and we're a 100% remote company. We have headquarters in Emeryville, um, but the vast majority of our company is all remote. Uh, I'm down in Monterey, California. Uh, and then I'm going to demonstrate those workflows through a few live demos of emulating a Tofino-like ASIC uh, inside of a hypervisor, uh, and then showing off some of the network tooling that we've written in a combination of P4 and Rust, which uh, X4C has allowed us to be able to do. And so getting started, uh, what is a uh, rack scale computer? And so what you're looking at here uh, is a picture of our product. Uh, it comes, uh, the minimum unit of compute that we sell is an entire rack. And so this is, this is what you're looking at. Um, we have 32 compute sleds uh, in the rack that are all based on AMD Milan. Uh, and then we have two switches uh, in the middle of the rack uh, there. I'm not sure, can folks see my mouse when I move it around? Yes, yes. Okay. Great. Um, so in the middle of the rack here, uh, here and here, we see these uh, two switches. Uh, they each have uh, 32 QSFP 28 ports hanging out the front. Uh, these are based on the Tofino 2 ASIC. Uh, and then out the back, uh, each one of these switches connects at 100 gigabits per second uh, over 100 G base KR4, so backplane spec. Uh, to each one of these compute slides. And so each compute slide connects to each switch. So we have uh, a physical multipath for a high availability setup in the network. 
Uh, what you see here in the very middle of the rack uh, are a pair of rectifiers. And so we're DC throughout the entire rack. We're not doing AC to DC for each individual unit, which gives us uh, power efficiency gains uh, going to all of these units. Um, and it's a fully integrated design. And so when a customer rolls this into their data center, um, there's a couple of ports here, uh, which we call technician ports to allow them to set up the basic parameters of like, how do I connect to you? Do I need to use uh, BGP? Do I need to use static routing? What have you? We just take a little bit of information uh, in through those ports and then the whole rack sets itself up. Uh, it provides an API for instantly launching uh, virtual machines and setting up networks and things like that. And it has a very cloud-like API. And so if you're used to using things like uh, AWS or GCP, things like that, uh, it provides that type of interface, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but this is just kind of the, the basic synopsis of, of what the product looks like. Um, so when you look at that picture on the last screen, you might think, oh, this is like repackaged hardware that they've put a bunch of nice software around, but that's actually not the case. This is all very customized hardware. So we built uh, our own baseboards for the Tofino. We have our own QSFP module boards for IO for the Tofino that use flyover cables from the Tofino to the front panels. Um, so that's what you're looking at on the left, this gigantic heat sink right here, which somewhat resembles the ship from Battlestar Galactica, uh, is the heat sink for the Tofino. Uh, so this is our, our switch board. And then on the right, this is uh, our uh, compute sled board, which we have uh, an AMD Milan hanging out here. Uh, and then these, this is IO for um, the disks that are coming out the front. And then just kind of uh, out the back here, we have power and um, our network uh, that are blind mated connections. And so there's no actual cabling that customers need to do uh, to connect things to the switches or to connect any of the aspects of the compute slides. They just slide them in. Uh, it's blind mated into the rest of the rack uh, and, and everything works like that. So uh, very customized hardware from the ground up. Uh, and so we started building the software and the operating systems drivers and all this stuff uh, before a lot of this hardware actually existed, which necessitated a workflow of, you know, how do we start to test our routing protocols or networking stacks, things like that, when we don't actually have all those quite put together yet. And that's where we were a couple of years ago. Okay, so where does P4 fit into all of this today? And so I realized this is uh, a little bit of an eye chart and there's there's a lot going on here, but I'll try to kind of like walk through it at a very high level. And so uh, the APIs that we have for our customers uh, are based on what the cloud providers uh, provide their customers. And so uh, if you've used AWS or GCP before, you're probably familiar with the concept of the VPC or the virtual private cloud, where you can define this networking context where a bunch of your instances are going to exist. Uh, and then you can give that to an API server and then that virtual network is going to be created inside the cloud. And in our case, it's going to be created uh, inside of our rack. Uh, and so what we're looking at on the right here is uh, kind of a hypothetical deployment where we have a pair of customer routers uh, that are connected to our middle of rack switches uh, that are running P4 in them. Uh, so this is kind of the, the P4 is the interface with our customer network. So it's it's critically important in that regard. Uh, and then inside of the rack, we're 100% IPv6 uh, and we use Geneve to create uh, virtual encapsulated networks uh, for overlay networks and things like that. And so some of the primary things the P4 code is doing here is it's uh, managing the encapsulation decapsulation boundary. So it's acting as a virtual tunnel endpoint. Uh, it's managing uh, the routing forwarding plane with our customers. And so if we're peering with them over BGP or whether they're creating static routes uh, on the rack itself, like all of that is plumbed down into P4, uh, into routing tables uh, and things like that in there. Uh, and we also do cooperate, what we call cooperative NAT uh, between uh, P4 here uh, and then our compute sleds down below. Uh, our compute sleds all run a custom Rust-based networking kernel module we called OPTE, uh, which is the Oxide Packet Transformation Engine. And OPTE is responsible for things like source NATing, so getting NAT going out on egress. It's responsible for firewalling, so we distribute our firewall 100% so we don't have scaling issues with centralized firewall 
Uh, and then, you know, firewalling is a very stateful thing. So it's somewhat difficult to implement in P4 for like a full blown connection tracking type of firewall thing. So that was another reason we chose to kind of distribute this at a lower level. Uh, and OPTE is also res responsible for doing encapsulation onto overlay networks. So it's cooperating with uh, the P4 implementation of Geneve for NCAP, BCAP, and getting packets uh, and things to where they need to go. Uh, we are explicitly multipath. We are 100% layer three uh, on our underlay network. So there's no broadcast domains that are shared between the compute sleds uh, or with the compute sleds in P4. There's just a single point to point uh, link local multicast domain uh, on a port by port basis between each one of the compute sleds uh, over IPv6 to uh, the switches. Uh, and that's the basics of, of kind of how our network is constructed. Uh, and so uh, I know this is a lot. I'll take any questions now uh, if we have any. All right. Well, I will keep driving through. So uh, taking a bit of a step back of why is network programmability important to us? Because we could have looked at what we need to be able to provide to our customers and said, yeah, we can probably do this with some sort of fixed function ASIC, right? We can use a Broadcom with a Broadcom NDK uh, or like a Mellanox Spectrum or something like that with the APIs that are provided for those, those ASICs. Uh, but this boils down to a few things, kind of an increasing level of importance to us. And so uh, flexibility is a uh, pretty big one. So we have like a good example is like how we're doing cooperative NAT. Like, could we have shoehorned that into like a Broadcom or a Spectrum or something like that? Yeah, we probably could have, but you're really kind of walking into the wind at that point. Like when you're trying to do something a little bit off reservation, like there's lots of risk there and you don't necessarily have a way out unless maybe you're like a huge customer of the ASIC provider, which at Oxide, we wouldn't be at that point and they would be willing to make changes to allow you to do what you're trying to do. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're kind of limited to the declarative configuration APIs that these type of ASICs have, uh, which is a little bit of a scary place to be. Uh, so flexibility is a big one. Uh, another big one was fit for purpose research usage. Uh, so TCAM is very precious uh, and with, I know with like Spectrum, for example, you can provide percentages of, okay, I want uh, ACLs to have this percentage of TCAM and I want multicast to have this percentage and routing tables to have this percentage. Uh, but it's it's very coarse in how you can decide how things get allocated. Uh, but with P4, you have much more control over that. And we've, you know, run into this, even with the Tofino and all the flexibility that we provide, like, we're up against a wall with the amount of TCAM that we have. And we have to be very careful about how we write our P4 code and how uh, the compiler is allocating TCAM for us and across stages and things like that. And so uh, having the ability to do fit for purpose research usage uh, is incredibly important for us. Uh, and then finally is comprehensibility. And this is probably the most important one here actually. And so, my background, I come uh, from building and operating uh, fairly large scale networks uh, and comprehensibility there is a big issue. Uh, when you're operating a large network, you have a responsibility to the organization that you're working for and the people working within that organization and with your partner organizations to keep those networks up and operating and performing to the, the expectations of the users. And when you have uh, very good networking equipment that ends at a declarative API where you can't really figure out what's going wrong when something has gone sideways. You don't have a, a mental model of the actual like execution fundamentals of how that piece of equipment is working. You're very limited in what you're able to do to be able to get in, dig in, uh, and solve problems. And so when we're delivering our product to our customers, we're delivering it as 100% open source. And so uh, they have all of the code that is running on our P4 switches, that is running the software driver stack that's driving that P4 switch. Uh, and so they have the ability and the autonomy to really be able to dig in, comprehend, and see, okay, what is going on? Like I have these packets coming into my Tofino. Here are all my P4 pipelines that are running this. Here are my control blocks. Here are my parser blocks. Like what is happening step-by-step step when this is happening? And we can start to figure out uh, what's going on. And we're we're moving beyond that to be able to provide like customized debugging tools, uh, trace tools uh, to be able to figure out, okay, the packets are actually flowing through this path. This is where it's going sideways inside P4. We're rejecting this packet for this reason, things like this. So 
really being able to give the customer the ability to solve their own problems and even go beyond that to say, okay, like I just need different P4 code for what I'm trying to do. Great. They can compile that and put it onto the platform. Obviously, you know, with us, we can provide limited support for that. But if that's something that they want to do, like it's their computer, they've bought it, they have the right to do that. Uh, and so that's, that's a really big thing for us. Question. So, I mean, Business-wise, I imagine you'll, you'll, of course, you'll sell to anybody that wants to buy. But this, the sweet spot for this seems to be sort of like large to medium-sized enterprises. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's that's definitely the sweet spot for for folks that have rack-scale computing requirements uh, that are looking to continue to run on-prem or move things from the cloud back on-prem. Thanks. Okay, uh, so now getting a little bit into the X4C stuff. Um, so. Why a new compiler? Uh, and so this is a question that uh, very obviously comes up if you're familiar with like the P4 ecosystem, right? So there's uh, the behavioral model version two and all the software ecosystem uh, around that, which is really great. And we got a lot of mileage out of that software ecosystem combined with like the customized tools that we get with Intel. Like with those two things, we were really able to get a start uh, with developing uh, our network stack. But where we kind of hit a wall with that for what we needed was the ability to run P4 code in a lot of very different kind of contexts. And so we needed to run P4 code inside of operating system kernels. Uh, we needed to run it uh, in user space with customized I.O. paths. We needed to run it in invest embedded Rust programs. We have a hypervisor that's written in Rust, but it's a constrained execution environment. We wanted to be able to run uh, that code there. And so um, lots of different places that we needed to run this code. And we were kind of stepping back and thinking, OK, well, we run Rust in all of these uh, environments. And so for those uh, not familiar with Rust. It's a it's a native programming language with no real runtime associated with it, and so you can compile down to native code and run pretty much anywhere. We run Rust inside the kernel. Uh, we have a microcontroller operating system uh, that runs on our baseboard management controller that is written in Rust, uh, and so Rust can pretty much run anywhere that you want it to. And so uh, we're like, hey, let's let's do a compiler for P4 that can generate Rust code, and then we can compile that Rust code to run wherever we see fit. Uh, inside of our infrastructure. Um, and that has actually uh, worked out really, really well for us. And so uh, what I'm going to be showing today are uh, in demos uh, are a few different workflows. And so the first workflow that I'm going to be showing uh, is uh, compilation from P4 uh, to a pipeline library. So like a, a shared uh, shared object that can be dynamically loaded by other code. Uh, and then loading that shared object uh, into a hypervisor that's emulating a Tofino ASIC uh, and actually having enough fidelity to trick our operating system drivers that run the Tofino, that a Tofino is in fact there, uh, and being able to run our whole networking stack on top of that, load P4 code into that, and actually run a facsimile of what our rack system looks like with all the routing protocols and data flows and encapsulation and everything that's going on inside that network. Uh, in this kind of nice little hypervisor-based environment. Uh, the second thing I'm going to show uh, is direct inclusion of P4 and Rust code and how that has enabled us to write some very cool tools in Rust for kind of building out and debugging and analyzing our network infrastructure. All righty. So uh, one last slide before we get into demos. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to be looking at today is ASIC emulation uh, in the hypervisor. So kind of working from, I guess, the bottom up makes the most sense here. And so when we have an ASIC like a Tofino um, or any other P4 programmable ASIC, we have uh, the ASIC and then we have a set of external facing ports uh, that are connecting to whatever they're connecting to. In our case, we're going to be simulating these are connecting to the compute sleds uh, in the oxide rack. Uh, this ASIC is connected over PCI Express to a host device. Uh, and that's also something interesting about uh, the Oxide architecture is that uh, in a lot of like the, the white label switches that you see, you'll have like an ASIC and then there's a little mezzanine board and that mezzanine board goes up to <clears throat> a controller with like a, an Intel Atom or like a Xeon D or something like that that's running Linux or some proprietary operating system that is controlling uh, that that platform. Uh, actually, what we do in our rack is we actually run uh, PCI Express to one of our compute sleds that's already in the rack. Uh, so we're using 
uh, one of the compute SUDs as the controller over PCI Express uh, to the ASIC. Uh, the reason that we did that in part was for uh, maintaining the security properties of our rack. So we don't run like BMCs or anything like that. We have a customized chip uh, called the cryptographic root of trust uh, that is managing the entire platform. And we didn't have bandwidth to design a root of trust for a different hardware platform than AMD uh, Milan at the time. Uh, and so we decided, hey, like this makes a lot of sense just to have the same platform all the way throughout. So we're going to run PCI Express up to uh, one of our compute sleds, or since there's two switches in the rack, two of our compute sleds. Uh, and we're going to run the entire control plane and driver stack for the switch there. So we have the ASIC running over PCI Express uh, into that device. And then in the middle range here, we have the kernel. Uh, and so in the kernel, we have a module called TF Packet, which basically takes packets directly from the Tofino over the PCI Express link. Um, we have a customized header that we slap on to all of the packets that are coming from the ASIC that are actually destined to the switch itself, right? So you have basically two different types of traffic here, right? You have traffic that's running from, it comes into one port, the P4 code turns on it and says, okay, this is, is gonna go out SP3. Uh, and so, you know, it never goes up, but for traffic that's actually destined to the switch itself, uh, we send it up through PCI Express. We put a customized header on it in P4 saying, okay, like some metadata, right? This is the port that it came from. Uh, this, is the, this is the port that it is gonna be destined to when it goes back out. Uh, things like that. And that header comes up here uh, into TF packet. Uh, and then we have another kernel module called TF port that basically looks at that header and says, okay, this packet came from SP0. So we need a uh, port that's available in user space called TP0 that directly corresponds. And we're going to take that customized header off, deliver it to TP0, and then whatever in the operating system that needs to deal with that packet can deal with it, whether it's like we're running IPv6, so NDP, uh, neighbor discovery protocol is very important. Um, we have routing demons and things like this that are running uh, in the in user space. And so uh, those demons can operate on all of those packets, uh, send them back down to TF port. TF port's going to create that uh, same customized header going back out down to TF packet, which is gonna serialize it onto PCI Express back out the ASIC and back out whatever port that it's, it's supposed to go out. So this is uh, the basic thing that we're gonna be showing today. Uh, and because of X4C, we can do this without actually having to do it on a real Tofino ASIC. So any questions here before I get into actually showing what this looks like in a terminal? That PC Express just goes over a, one of your custom backplane connections effectively sort of like? Yep. And what's and you mentioned a microcontroller earlier. What's the what's the memory size of that microcontroller that you got this to fit on? So it's a um, STM thirty two uh, that you would find on like the Nucleo development boards. I do not know offhand the amount of memory that's it's available on those, but it, it's very very limited. Uh, it's like a it's an ARM based platform, and it, it's yeah very very small. Yeah, Ryan, this is Chris. Um, any performance considerations using PCIe for this uh, versus, let's say, a, a CPU management port on the ASIC and standard NIC um, kind of interface? Yeah, so in the limit, I suppose there could be. We don't anticipate this being high rate traffic. Um, so this is a, a PCI Express Gen 4 by four lanes, I believe. Uh, and this is mostly for things like NDP traffic for router traffic for peering over a BGP like protocol. Um, so we don't anticipate a, a huge amount of traffic here. But I mean, if we do, I think we can, I think we can push this thing actually quite hard since it's a PCI Express Gen 4 by four. Uh, so we could probably push 10 gigabits through there if we needed to. Got it. Thanks. All righty, so I am going to exit full screen here and I'm going to stop sharing this window and I'm going to find the other window that I'm sharing. It's right here. Wow, I have way too many windows. All right. Um, you sure wonder if we see the top of a browser with three tabs. Okay, yeah, that's I'm I'm trying to figure out how to switch to okay, I think it's this one. 
now I see a four-way terminal. Yep. All right, cool. Um, so I will throw this up just for context. <clears throat> One of the nice things about doing diagrams and ASCII is you can just put them anywhere. Um, so what I'm going to be showing, so uh, right now I'm on the terminal of, an, uh, of a switch uh, that is running inside of our hypervisor that has the, uh, tef the emulated Tofino ASIC uh, sitting below it. Um, and so if, uh, and I've preloaded our kernel modules in here. And so what we see is we have a couple of, uh, these are vert IO interfaces. Uh, for those that are curious, the operating system that we use for everything at Oxide, uh, except for the microcontrollers is the Illumos operating system, which is a descendant of Solaris. Um, <clears throat> but is a free and open source uh, operating system. Uh, and so just looking at the data links that I have, I see I have my, my TF packet here because I've, I've preloaded the, the Fino drivers into the kernel. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to start up uh, what we call our data plane daemon, uh, which manages the switch drivers in the kernel, uh, which is just going to... Uh, basically spew out a bunch of non-relevant -rele information. I'm also going to start um, our port manager, um, which is the counterpart to, so I, I started the counterpart to TF packet in user space. Now I'm going to start the counterpart to TF port uh, in user space. Uh, and so I'm going to run TF port D. That's just going to spew a bunch of stuff. But now uh, when I look at the data link interfaces that we have, we can see that uh, the kernel has created these, what we call TF port rear uh, zero through three. Uh, and so we're just basically uh, looking at the this TP zero, one, two, and three here. Uh, and so uh, actually I have to stop this because I forgot a step in my demo. Um, one of the things that we have to do uh, is actually load the uh, P4 program. Um, and so I have a little tool uh, called Sidecar Admin. Sidecar is the name that we gave to our switch um, in early development and it's kind of uh, stuck around for quite a long time. Uh, I think actually in the notes that Andy sent out, there is a podcast, uh, not the one that I was mostly driving, but uh, Arian from our team who designed the hardware aspect of the switch uh, talked a lot about the design of the Sidecar and the, the very interesting adventures we had with, with bringing that up. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and... Actually, let me take a step back real quick, because this talk is ostensibly about our P4 compiler. Um, and so the code that we're going to be, the P4 code that we're going to be running uh, on this uh, emulated ASIC uh, is actually right here in my terminal window. It's it's uh, nothing particularly special. Uh, it's, uh, it's code that has like a layer three router in it. It has some IPv6 NDP stuff. Uh, it has... Uh, packet parsers that handle a whole bunch of things like VLANs and uh, that's our customized sidecar header that I was talking about, art packets, IPv6, like a lot of standard run-of-the-mill stuff that you would expect uh, in a P4 program. Uh, and so compiling this uh, with X4C is just as simple as, uh, so if I run uh, X4C help, uh, I get a little help menu that tells me how to use uh, this, but I'm just going to basically compile this program, uh, which we call Sidecar Lite. Um, and it says nothing if compilation was successful, but what you get out of this, and so this is what, this is like 800 some odd lines of P4 code. Uh, what we get out of this uh, is it basically generates an out.rs file uh, that generates a whole bunch of Rust code. Um, we've got about seven, just shy of 7,000 lines of Rust code uh, that basically implements uh, this, uh, this P4 code. Um, and then just going back to the P4 code itself. Uh, and after I get through the demos, I'm going to show some of the documentation associated with this. So it's not just like it, it generates a blob and like go read the code and good luck. We do have some documentation if you're interested in integrating this tooling into your own workflows about uh, there's a predictable interface, uh, which we call the pipeline trait or the pipeline interface uh, for all of this code that's generated that allows you to write code uh, around this code that's either Rust code um, or we expose a C ABI. And so if Rust is not your thing, uh, then you can interact with this over C as well. Uh, that, that P4 is not standard P4, right? It's uh, the transition statement is supposed to be the last in a parser. 
it, it, it was, and it's perfectly standard. I've just never seen a parser written that way, but it looks perfectly legal. I don't know. I don't know if you can have a transition statement inside an if statement. Yeah, and, uh, and syntactically, it's legal. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the, that, that actually brings up an interesting point. So because we're generating Rust, we have an extraordinary amount of flexibility uh, with what we can do. We can pretty much do anything that we want. Uh, and that doesn't always line up with the constraints of hardware platforms. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of P4 code that, for example, that our, that X4C will accept um, that Tofino, the Tofino compiler will not accept because of the constraints of the hardware uh, and, and things like that. One of the things that we're actively working on is compiler emulation modes to more closely emulate what the native compiler uh, is providing. So you can get early indications of, yes, like we can do this because we're just generating Rust code to run on x86, but like emit a warning saying this is not going to fly on the, the platform that you're ultimately targeting. The other is I'll admit, Miha, it is on the hairy edge, and I bet some other compilers wouldn't accept it, but we know what it means <laughs> for sure. Uh, the uh, question for you, Ryan, um, did you create your own P4 architecture? Did you kind of I mean, did we create a subset of the Tavino native architecture or some other variant? Yeah. So we, our goal was to start as simple as possible. So we created what we called the soft NPU architecture. Um, and it's just a very simple, straightforward architecture that takes very simple metadata. Uh, and it is nowhere near as complex as a lot of the, or any of the other hardware-based architectures that are out there. Is there any multicast support, for example? Yes, there is multicast support. Okay, cool. That's, that's, that's not, that's not nothing. Yep, there's multicast and like uh, Ethernet broadcast and, and all that stuff. Um, and then so, you know, just just playing around here, right? If we if we change one of these things to something that is clearly not going to fly, uh, then we get a nice error message. Um, we spent a fair amount of time trying to make the error messages uh, in here very nice uh, and consumable, especially for folks that are working on our team that don't work with P4 day to day uh, to try to provide them kind of like the best guidance for what's going on when they're they're working with this infrastructure. Um, and so uh, one other thing I'm going to show while I'm here is, OK, so great, you can you can run some you can generate some Rust code, but how does this actually make it into something that is freestanding and executable? Uh, so. If I go down here into this little Rust crate, so if you're not familiar with Rust, Rust organizes its code around crates, and each crate is more or less like a translation unit. If you're coming from like a C++ type of, of background of all this stuff goes into like a single shared library or a single executable, uh, things like that. Uh, and so uh, if I come down here uh, and look at this uh, Rust code, uh, this is one of the really fun aspects about the way that we built this. So we built this not only as a standalone P4 compiler executable, we've actually built it as a P4 compilation uh, library. Uh, and Rust has these things called macros um, where you can execute code at compilation time. Uh, and there's a very powerful infrastructure inside of Rust for Rust code generation. And we leverage that heavily. Uh, this idea I cannot take credit for. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Adam Leventhal at um, Oxide uh, has used this approach for uh, open API. So uh, all of our high level API interfaces in the Oxide platform use open API specifications and to generate client code for those, we have this Rust code that basically like we have an open API compiler and it operates over that open API specification and automatically generates client code um, for those open API specifications. So I was like, hey, that's that's neat. And that saves us a whole ton of time in development. So let's do that for P4. Uh, and so what we're seeing here in this P4 macro use P4 is I'm just referencing this file that's going to uh, instruct the Rust compiler to basically uh, ingest that file. It's going to run our compilation library over that file and inject it into this program here. Uh, that that I'm running uh, or that I'm trying to that I'm trying to compile. Um, and then if I just look uh, a little bit further here um, uh, in my cargo.toml, which is just like a Rust specific, where you're telling the Rust compiler like what do I want to achieve out of this Rust code? I'm just saying I want um, a dynamic library out of this. Um, and so when I compile this, um, 
what I get is this, this lib sidecar light.so, uh, which is a shared library that I can dynamically load uh, in other places. And so that's where we're going to pick up in the demo. As I've compiled this, uh, I've put it onto my virtual machine, uh, and I'm going to load it onto the ASIC uh, in the hypervisor. And so jumping back over here uh, to the demonstration, uh, and so uh, a relevant question here is, okay, so how does this get down into the hypervisor? And something that is not in the picture here uh, is that this ASIC in the virtual hardware that we've created uh, exposes a UART interface uh, for messaging and control. Uh, and so uh, this command that I'm going to run is basically going to shove this shared library through a UART uh, down to the virtual hardware that's going to dynamically load that P4 code onto the virtual ASIC that we're running. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Uh, okay, so that's loading through the UART. So the P4 code is now on the ASIC, and that means we're ready to run our switch control plane. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get that started up now with the TF packet and the TF port uh, user space programs. And so... Now we should be able to, and over that UART, um, there's also like a simple administration, uh, administrative protocol uh, or management protocol to be able to look at the state of the ASIC. Um, so if I just do dump state, I can see that our management plan has already put a whole bunch of information um, on, into the tables uh, inside of this P4 program. So like we have our local IPv6 addresses, which if I look at deal atom should, oops, not deal atom, IP atom, uh, should match what we have here. So we have something ending in 9CBF, um, and we have 9CBF over here. So it's basically synchronizing all this information onto the ASIC. So the ASIC can see when an IPv6 packet comes in for this particular link local address, it says, okay, that's destined to the host. I'm going to basically catapult it uh, up PCI Express uh, up to the host. And so that's what we're doing. We've set up a bunch of MAC addresses. Uh, we're also synchronizing the host operating system's NDP tables uh, onto the ASIC so we can do dynamic resolution uh, for frames going across the wire uh, and, and all of that stuff. And so what's really cool about this is this is all our production code that runs on a real Tofino ASIC. We We've just tricked it just enough with the hypervisor and being able to run P4 and all that and having like the same P4 table names and things like that to where our, our switch driver platform can actually run all of this. And I'm just running this on like I have a AMD Ryzen machine in my closet that's, that's running all this. Um, and so the next thing that we're going to do is we want to actually see packets run. Uh, so to do that, like I said before, um, we have no layer two at all uh, inside of the rack. We're 100% layer three. Uh, so I'm going to start a routing daemon so we can get some, some routes propagated across this infrastructure. Um, so I'm just going to run my PDM routing daemon. Um, and... Is DDM a well-known routing protocol implementation that I might not be familiar with? Uh, it's something like, that we uh, have homegrown at Oxide. It's a routing protocol that I actually designed after many, many years of experience with BGP. Um, it's a path vector routing protocol. I talk about it in the um, in our recent uh, podcast that we had uh, with Oxide and friends about our network architecture. Uh, and so it's it stands for delay driven multipath. Um, and so we're basically uh, optimizing multipath decisions based on delay that's instrumented across the network uh, instead of using like static ECMP hashing, for example. Thanks. Um, so, oh, I left DDM running. So uh, that's why we already have peers uh, is DDM uh, has has already been running. And so I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to shut these down because that means the routes will already have propagated automation working against my demo of showing something not working then working because I suspect this will just work now because they've advertised all the prefixes. Um, what do we have in our state? So yeah, so we already we already have prefixes hanging out on the ASIC. So I guess we can we can jump straight to that. And so we started up a routing daemon um, and it automatically peered with a couple of other routing daemons that. I had originated a set of prefixes for, so this FD00 uh, colon one, FD00 colon two. Um, 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to two nodes. Which nodes am I jumping over to? I'm jumping over to uh, S0 and uh, S3, right? So we have two nodes hanging off S0 and S3 uh, off of the ASIC here. Uh, when I started this routing daemon, uh, they automatically peered with this routing daemon, which because the packets were going up through the ASIC all the way through this chain up to here. And, you know, we're starting to see the advantages of this approach because this is, there's a lot of complicated machinery in here that we have to be able to test. And we can test this all in CI. And we do actually test all this in CI because we're able to launch the whole stack uh, just on a regular bare metal CI instance that gets provisioned automatically and run end-to-end -end routing tests uh, and things like that. And so, uh, we've actually already automatically peered. We already have the routes in the ASICS routing table. And if I go down here um, and just look at the IP addresses, and I want to ping uh, at the 002 colon colon one, uh, then I can do that. Uh, it's alive. And then so, but for example, if I were to take out this routing daemon, so I've just control C it essentially. Um, and if I do, if I look for my peers, so I only have one peer now. Uh, and if I look at my state, uh, that route has been withdrawn because DDM will automatically withdraw routes uh, when peers disappear. And just to make sure, you know, I'm not being sneaky and I'm just actually using the operating systems routing table, we can do a net stat our F I net six and grep for FD00. Uh, so there's absolutely nothing there. The operating system is not facilitating any of this routing whatsoever. Uh, and if I go back here and I try to do the same ping, uh, then I essentially have no, no route to host. Uh, I'm getting the ICMP message back from the switch. Uh, but if I start DDMD back up again, um, then we'll see that our peers have come back. Uh, and we can also just look at the prefixes that, oh, I need to advertise the prefix again. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so I'm going to advertise this prefix over here, go back to my switch, look at the prefixes that's showed up in the upper, upper half of the routing protocol. Uh, and if I look at the state that we have, then this route is back down here in the ASIC. And now I can ping this node again. Um, so this is just a very kind of small demonstration of uh, running this fairly complicated stack end to end uh, by uh, using X4C to tell some creative lies through a hypervisor to a complicated networking stack that it actually has uh, an ASIC below it. So any questions at this point? Lots of demos were smiling upon you today. Yes, yeah, they were. Uh, I did test this right before just to make sure everything was was hunky dory. But yeah, we're 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 doing good so far. But we have one more to get through. Um, so, but this one's much less complicated. Um, okay. one, one quick question: I uh, the the low level the 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 control plane API for table ads deletes just about on top of P four. What did you choose to implement there? As simple as we possibly could. So it's just a very simple binary protocol um, that, so like I can just walk through it, right? It's 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 that simple. Um, so, it, but it's a it's a custom one basically that you you created yourself. It's not P front end API or some other. Yeah, it's very low level. Like it's just it, it's a serialization scheme more than anything. Okay. Um, so for example, like if we look at like if I. If I just go find a table, right? So like my NAT table here, I have um, I have two keys. I have uh, an IPv4 uh, address, and then that's an exact. And then I have a range on the uh, ingress NAT ID, which I think is a U16. Um, and so basically, what this is going to look like in the protocol is you get you get a, you get 32 bits here, uh, and then you're going to get 16. Well, no, 32 bits here because it's a range. So we're going to have two of them. Um, and it's just binary serialized data uh, of those bits in Big Indian that are going across the down to the, the ASIC over a UART. Yep, something simple. Yep, very, very, very simple and low level. Um, somewhat error prone, as we found out. It's very easy to mess this up, um, but very simple. Um, 
Okay. Um, if I may, I have a question. Uh, so I am wondering uh, if, since you are uh, basically uh, running a lot of tests in simulations, if you have come across some interesting problems that only manifested in the real hardware and what you did about them. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we have unlimited memory essentially in the simulation environment because we have DRAM and we have dynamic virtual memory in the operating system. So we can take a, we can, I could build a 5 billion entry routing table if I wanted to, no problem, right? Um, and you obviously can't do that in hardware. You have very limited TCAM space. I mean, even if you're using like algorithmic, T algorithmic TCAM or something like that, like you're constrained and then you're constrained on like the Tofino is like a VLIW architecture, right? So you have pipeline stages and you have very specific things that you can fit on the match action units in those pipeline stages. And it's very constrained. And if you go over, like, I think the Tofino two has 20, 20 stages, 20 pipeline stages. And so like, if you go over what can be squeezed into those 20 pipeline stages with the match action units that are in each stage, like you have to figure out how you're gonna go reconfigure your code to do that. Um, we definitely do want to target uh, having a lot of those constraints in this compiler and being able to emulate it for a uh, chip by chip architecture. So like right now, Tofino is at the core of our product. Uh, we're also looking uh, for the next version of the product at what the programmable edge is going to look like um, for the the NICs uh, and using like the portable NIC architecture. So we'll have different constraints for those devices. And so in this uh, emulator, we want to be able to emulate those constraints, but we're not there yet. Do you plan on open okay. sourcing this back end? I'm sorry? Do you plan on uh, open sourcing this, upstreaming it to P4C? The rest uh, so everything I'm going over today is open source. Um, it's it's all up and available. Yeah, it's on GitHub, but it's not part of the P4C repo. I get it. And just based on P4C's front end uh, and you know, tool chain, is it just a new back end? Uh, this is a front end and a back end. So the front end, we wrote a custom recursive descent parser. Um, and then the, the back ends, we have our Rust back end, which is open source. And then once our little pet project, uh, RISC-V ASIC thing uh, becomes a reality, then, then that will be open source as well. Wow, great. Alrighty, um, so what I'm going to show now is a slightly, okay, and we have nine minutes, so I'll try to be quick. Um, a slightly different take on what we can use P4 for, and that's using P4 to do the heavy networking lifting and combining that with a Rust program to make a unique and interesting tool. Uh, and so um, I guess I'll show the demo first, and then I'll show how P4 makes this possible. Um, so, Target, release, Overwatch. So we have this tool called Overwatch, and this is a packet tracing tool, much like TCP dump uh, or Snoop, if you've used that. Uh, and so um, I'm just going to start running this uh, and show it by example, and then I'll show how it works and how P4 makes it possible. Um, so I'm going to Snoop, and I'll just do IGB0, which is uh, an interface that is on this machine. Um, and then let's just see that this is going to be like a, okay, so that's like a massive flood of packets because there's lots of stuff going on on this network, but let's let's try to constrain this a little bit. Let's say, um, oops, forgot you. Let's say that I want this to be IPv4 only. Oh, man, all right, come on. Uh, IPv4 only, and then um, let's say the IP proto, let's do UDP. Okay, so this is a little bit more manageable of a stream. So this basically looks like uh, a TCP dump type of thing. Um, but what's interesting about this is this is this is a Rust program, um, but it is all of the heavy lifting for the networking is actually done uh, with P4. Uh, and so if I go and take a look at this code, I guess we'll look at the source code for the Rust first. Um, if I just go into my, my main program here, uh, what I see is this, this little trick that I was showing off before with how we dynamically include P4 code into our Rust code. I'm just saying include this, this overwatch.p4 um, and give it the pipeline name overwatch. Uh, and then that basically dumps a whole bunch of 
compiled Rust code uh, into this, this main translation unit. Um, and then if I go down to my Snoop code, um, then I just basically have written a harness uh, around this code. And so um, the thing that I did before was I set the, uh, what did I do? I set the IP proto to UDP. So let's, let's look for proto. So just looking at what I've done for this. Um, and so this kind of gets to your question earlier, Andy, of like, what is the interaction model between these things? Um, and so uh, if NCAP, let's just ignore encapsulation for the moment, but I have this pipeline object in my REST code that was compiled in from the P4 code dynamically. Um, and then I'm just basically saying, add an entry to ingress IPv4 uh, proto entry, uh, and this is going to be the keep action. So I guess I'll pull up the P4 code at the same time, because that will make this much easier to talk about. Um, Overwatch, yes. Uh, so if I look at my ingress controller, uh, I have a table in here called, uh, where are we going to? We're gonna go to IPv4 uh, is the next place we're gonna go. So if I go to control IPv4, uh, we're gonna go here and here we see the keep and the drop action. So that's what we're specifying here is our keep and our drop. Um, and then for this, we're doing the uh, proto entry in here. So if I go down to the, so this ref, so this proto here, uh, proto and proto, uh, that's what this represents. And it just takes a ternary uh, IPv4 protocol, uh, which is just gonna be the U8 that's in the, the IP packets. Um, and then we're basically, we're doing key as slice, which is just basically telling Rust to create this key uh, as a slice of bits. Uh, we have a proto that's a U8 that's passed in. This little one that's leading in front of it is because it's a ternary key. So the one indicates the care versus don't care of the ternary aspect. And this 100 is just a priority uh, on the table. This empty array that you see here is the action parameters. Uh, and as we can see with keep and drop, we don't have any parameters. Uh, so that's just empty. Um, and then when we look at what the P4 code is doing uh, for this type of stuff, uh, we basically have two, for the keep and the drop, we basically have drop as a ternary. Um, and so anytime we're gonna create a uh, ternary don't care. Uh, so anytime we say we only wanna look at a particular protocol, we're gonna put that into our keep as a ternary care, uh, give it a table priority of hundred. And then for everything else that come, so when we insert that key, we also insert the drop key saying, okay, this is the only thing I wanna focus on. So anything else that matches anything for that proto using the ternary, don't care, drop it. So I can just filter uh, based on what I want to see uh, inside of the network. And so what this allowed us to do was create this very nice packet tracing tool that can dive all the way down into like our Geneva encapsulated headers, perform logic on them. We have a whole bunch of Rust code in here to be able to do like checksum verification and doing a whole bunch of sanity checking. But the real heavy lifting uh, much like the olden days of uh, TCP dump, if you remember when the guts of TCP dump used to actually be the BPF virtual machine uh, that was executing that optimized uh, BPF code, this is much in the same spirit of that, except for we're using P4. And when we have P4 programmable NICs, we're hoping to be able to do this on those NICs as well, instead of just compiling to Rust in user space and having that, that interaction there too for some, some high-speed processing. Uh, and so this, uh, we just open sourced this tool last night uh, because I was gonna be mentioning it in the talk today. So it's open and available right now. It works for the Lumos operating system, uh, but if folks are interested in supporting it to Linux or FreeBSD, uh, what have you, Windows, I, I don't know much about Windows, but maybe um, then then that would, uh, we would, we would support that. Um, and with that, I think that, concludes the demo. I had one more slide, um, but it just basically describes what I just showed. Uh, so I think I'll end it there because I have uh, less than a minute left. Very cool. So this Overwatch is basically like mostly command line parsing. And when it sees certain command line options, it does table add operations into your P4 program that's embedded in the code. Yep, that's exactly what it's doing.
And and how do you um, hook up like when you have a P4 program embedded in the code? How do you tell it which packets to process, or how do you direct packets to it, or get packets out of it? Oh, so that was the uh, so that was the the I pointed it at a physical interface, uh, and so it's taking everything from that physical interface using a, a packet capture uh, on a Lumos. We have something called DLPI, which is basically like PCAP, uh, and so it's it's getting all the packets on that interface. And then as you add command line parameters, so I can I can actually share screen uh, again. Um, I guess the output packets are going to your code somewhere. Yep, yeah, the app output packets come in the pipeline. Uh, anything that is not of interest to the filters uh, get dropped in the P4 code. Um, and so if we look just real quickly at um, just the Snoop, If we just look at this helmet, like there's a whole bunch of basically options here. You know, I can filter on IP source, IP destination, IP proto, uh, VLAN, VIDs, inner packet, all that stuff. And that's just populating tables in P4. Uh, and then we have, uh, it's basically like we're embedding a two port switch. Uh, and anything that makes it through the filters is going to go out the second port uh, and make it into the Rust program. And the Rust program is going to render that in the format that we saw the packets fly by in. Any other questions? Well, you still didn't say why you didn't use the open source compiler. This way, you, you as the language evolves, you'll have to keep up. Yeah, we do definitely have to keep up. Uh, I mean, the, the rationale uh, for, for building this compiler was the variety of places that we need to be able to to put Rust in. Um, and we wanted to build kind of like this dependency-free Rust compiler uh, that is very simple for uh, our folks to be able to, to pick up, use, uh, and, and throw P4 code where, wherever we need it to go. So it's the dependencies really. You think the, P, the P4C compiler has too many dependencies? Uh, you, that can't is, put, you can't put C++ in Linux kernel, right? Yeah. No, no, this has nothing to do with the C++, right? The compiler can generate code in any language, right? It generates C, for example, for eBPF. Yeah, I mean we're uh, we're a Rust shop, uh, and we we looked at the difficulty, uh, the basically the difficulty versus reward of uh, putting together uh, a greenfield Rust front end, uh, and we we thought the trade off was worth it of just writing a customized recursive descent parser because that's to be honest not the the hardest part of all this. The hardest part is the code generation. Um, and you know, we we generate an HLIR, uh, high level IR that we do a lot of semantic checking over and things like that. Um, and we're able to plug in some oxide specific things that we're we're very concerned about. Um, but yeah, we we just looked at the risk versus reward of greenfielding the front end and decided that was well, that was worth it for us. All right. Um uh, this is Theo Jepson. I have a quick question about um, switches versus NICs. Because at the end, you, you mentioned that uh, they can run this on a NIC. What in, in your design now, you, you have those two Tofinos. What if you moved all that to all that logic to the edge, to the NICs? So all is a big word, right? Um, mm -hmm all of the logic will never move completely to the edge. I mean, even if you have a very simple switch uh, on the outside, it's it's still got to do basic layer three routing and forwarding. And there's there's actually a lot going on there. Uh, and so I, I understand the architecture of pushing more things out to the edge and distributing things for scalability. And we do do that with our like packet translation architecture. We do a lot of our heavy lifting, especially stateful, uh, packet processing at the edges, uh, and we're looking to leverage PNA and P4 to do that as we get more programmable hardware uh, at the edge. But I don't think that our need for P4 in the core of the network at the switch is ever going to go away. Uh, there's a question in chat. Can one do FFI from the generated Rust, that is generated .so, and use it on language X? Yeah, uh, so we do try to maintain a C ABI, uh, so you can you can use your language of choice. Um, I'll be completely candid; not super. It's not in our CI process, so it may fall out of sync. 
Um, but that is a goal is to have a C ABI uh, to allow other languages to bind through FFI. Thank you. Cool. Um, any one last maybe short question? We don't want to go too much over time here. Can you share the URL to your uh, code base, the upstream? Yeah, I'll yeah. just drop it in the chat. Here. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to go ahead and chat, and I'll put it in the meeting notes too. Thank you. Okay. Interesting presentation. Thanks. Uh, they they have an org on GitHub called Oxide Computer, and uh, that's where the compiler lives. Thank you. Yep. Well, thanks again, Ryan. This is a very uh, interesting talk, uh, and I look forward to seeing. Uh, what you and other people do with it. I imagine other people will probably, you'll probably get a few hits on this. Uh, you can check out the traffic meter on your next week and see if spike maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much everybody uh, for the time uh, and look forward to interacting with folks in the working group meetings and whatnot. Bye everybody.